Welcome back, everyone. Several places in the Quran describe some Jews who were transformed into animals. So let's jump right into this topic with a word that everyone knows, lycanthropy. Lycos or lukos from the Greek meaning wolf and anthropos meaning man, wolf, man. You can see what this term is primarily meant for. However, lycanthropy has a broader definition as well. Here's a dated resource from the early 1900s. Lycanthropy is connected with a wider belief in human transformation into animal form, which is of universal occurrence. As I said, this is an old resource, but I'm citing it for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's so old, it's free, so you can look it up online if you want. And when you go to the entry for lycanthropy, you will see the second reason I'm citing it. There is an exhaustive survey of various forms of beliefs of human to animal transformation in various parts of the world. We're not going to go into those details here, but what I want you to know is what we heard a couple of seconds ago. Beliefs about human to animal transformation are of universal occurrence. And as we've seen, we have one such example in the Quran. Now, before we get into the Quran specifically, I want to first address Muslims who want to claim that these verses about Jew monkeys are metaphorical. Let's start with Ibn Kathir. We said to them, be you monkeys despised and rejected. These people were turned into howling monkeys with tails after being men and women. Ibn Abbas is reported to have said of be you monkeys despised and rejected that it means Allah changed their bodies into those of monkeys and swines. The young people turned into monkeys while the old people turned into swine. Tafsir Jalalain, we said to them, be apes despised, rejected, and they became so and died three days later. Mujahid is an exception. He argued for a largely metaphorical interpretation of these verses. About him, Tabri states that Mujahid is in contradiction with a clear indication of the book of God, for God relates in his book that he made them into monkeys and pigs. al Qurtubi states Mujahid has narrated in his tafsir that only their hearts were transformed and their intellect was made like that of monkeys. As far as I know, this hasn't been said by any other commentator, and Allah knows best. Further, al Qurtubi in his tafsir gives us some fascinating additional details in the Arabic version. I'm unable to find these details in the corresponding English translation of his first volume for some reason. The apes identified their human relatives, approached them, smelled their clothes, and cried. The humans, in contrast, could not identify their relatives, but told them, didn't we forbid you from violating the word of God? The apes nodded their heads in assent. Maldudi says the words of the Quran indicate that it was a physical metamorphosis. In my opinion, their bodies were transformed into those of apes, but their human minds were left intact in order to subject them to extreme torture. So Muslims, if in response to this video you want to argue that these verses are metaphorical, you're arguing against the clear reading of the Quran, the vast majority of your commentators, and your prophet. We'll talk about what he said later. Now, if you've been following this channel, you know that the Quran draws from many different sources. So let's see if we can find out where these stories came from that we read in the Quran. Let's start in Surah 7. Ask them refers to the people of the book. We see this numerous times in the Quran, and they presumably know the answer from their books. Then we have the detail about the town near the sea. Notice there are some similarities to Numbers 11.31. Then a wind from the Lord sprang up, and it brought quail from the sea, and let them fall beside the camp. So Numbers 11.31 tells us where the quail came from, but not that the people were in a town, or even how near the sea they were. Further, Numbers says quail, not fish, contrary to the Quran. So the Quran then appears to take the quail as fish, since the earlier texts say that quail came up from the sea. The Quran doesn't mention any fishing, however, the Israelites apparently simply go to collect the fish as they came up to the surface of the water. Obviously, when the quail became fish, then the location where this happens, a town, has to be close to the sea. Notice that this story in the Quran bears a resemblance to the Talmud, where some people in Babylon caught fish from an overflowing pond on the Sabbath and were punished. So which of these sources influenced the Quran? Well, keep in mind that when we're looking at the Quran's borrowing of material, we're often not looking for a one-to-one -one match. Rather, we're looking for a garbled mixture of a variety of sources. Heinrich Speyer says it well. In any case, it appears that Muhammad here, as so often, mixed together various elements of legends. Now, another difference in the Quran is the reason for the punishment. 
In the Bible, the sin has to do with ungratefulness and greed. In the Quran, the problem is violating the Sabbath, even though Allah had baited them into it by sending the fish on the Sabbath. So the problem in the Quran is collecting food on the Sabbath, which sounds like something in Exodus 16. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, but the following day is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. So what the Quran seems to have done is mixed Numbers 11, 31 through 35 with Exodus 16, 22 through 26, and possibly with a story about collecting fish on the Sabbath that's found in the Talmud. Why can't Allah get his sources right? In addition to the differences just discussed, there's another conspicuous difference. In the book of Numbers, God sends a plague on the Israelites. However, in the Quran, the punishment is a bit different. Allah wasn't monkeying around. We said to them, become apes, skulking away. But why apes? In Numbers and in Jewish tradition that comments on this episode, there is some bodily effect, nausea, vomiting, and so forth. But in the Quran, obviously things are quite different. Spire has collected a number of prior sources that the Quran may have drawn from. Here are just a couple of examples. The context is the Tower of Babel, as you can see where the Talmud tells us explicitly that the wrongdoers were turned into apes. And according to Genesis, Rabbah, the human race degenerated from the days of Enosh, and humans looked like apes. And Augustine also details the transformation of men into animals according to Greek and other legends. Often the gods in Greek mythology would change humans into animals when they misbehaved. As Augustine demonstrated, this is a very common occurrence. And we've already seen this one, an additional story in the Talmud, where similar to the Quran, people gather fish on the Sabbath and are punished. Another well-known example comes from a first century Latin poem, where a bad and treacherous race is transformed into animals. So once again, the Quran draws from numerous different sources, smushes them all together, and serves it to us in a big, messy sandwich that Muslims call the Word of Allah. But remember, this is history. Remember how Surah 7163 starts off, talking about Allah's action in history. Ask them about the town which was near the sea, and then describes Allah's response. We said to them, become apes. This mixing happens numerous times in the Quran. Think about Abraham. Some of what happens to Abraham in the Quran happens to Abraham in the Torah, but the Quran also throws in some Talmud and some Genesis Rabbah and a couple of other things just for fun. Or in Surah 27, we have the story of Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Sounds a little bit like 1 Kings 10. However, the Quran mixes in a whole bunch of legendary material about Solomon. And in verse 44 of that same Surah, we have the water episode, which is a test applied to ascending mystics in ancient mystical literature. How did it get there in Surah 27? Or we have Surah 38. There we have some apparently garbled references to Deuteronomy 17 and maybe 1 Kings 5. However, in verses 34 and 35 of the very same Surah, we have a story from the Talmud about Solomon and Ashmedai, the king of the demons, adapted into Surah 38. It's as if the Quran took a bunch of different puzzle pieces from different puzzles and smushed them all together into one massively incoherent picture. Speaking of incoherent, let's go back to the tafsir and then we'll head to the hadith. Remember, Kortubi told us that the apes identified their human relatives, approached them, smelled their clothes, and cried. The humans, in contrast, could not identify their relatives, but told them, Didn't we forbid you from violating the word of God? The apes nodded their heads in assent. These monkeys have quite the personality. From Sahil Bukhari, narrated Amir bin Mamun, during the pre-Islamic period of ignorance, I saw a she-monkey surrounded by a number of monkeys. They were all stoning it because it had committed illegal sexual intercourse. I stoned it too, along with them. Now remember, that was during the pre-Islamic period of ignorance. I am so glad that Muhammad came along and brought us out of that pre-Islamic period period of ignorance. Speaking of Muhammad, let's hear what he had to say. The Jews were apparently transformed into all kinds of animals. Some lizards were brought to Muhammad. He took a stick and counted its fingers. He then said, a group from the children of Israel was transformed into an animal of the land, and I do not know which animal it was. Or in another narration, a lizard was presented to Muhammad 
but he refused to eat it, saying, I do not know. Perhaps it is descended from one of the generations who were transformed. Which is why you get more points with Allah for killing a lizard with one blow. If it takes you two or three blows, you still get points, but not as many points as if you killed it with one blow. Now enough about lizards. Let's talk about rats and sheep milk. Muhammad said a group of Israelites were lost. Nobody knows what they did, but I do not see them except that they were cursed and changed into rats. For if you put the milk of a she-camel in front of a rat, it will not drink it. But if the milk of a sheep is put in front of it, it will drink it. Christians imagine how embarrassing it would be if Jesus said stupid stuff like that. Now, why so many animals, according to Muhammad? In the Quran, it's relatively limited to apes and pigs. But Muhammad said a whole lot more raises questions about how these hadith were compiled. In his 9th century treatise, The Book of Animals, the greatest of these authors, Al-Jahiz, mentions that it is generally thought that the cheetah, eel, white ant, mouse, and lizard were originally Jews. He mentions the tradition telling how a sage saw a man eating a lizard and said to him, Know that you have eaten one of the sheikhs of the sons of Israel. The proof of this is that the lizard's foot resembles the human hand. Wow. Well, if that isn't clear proof then what is? <sighs> this is all so stupid. But there's more. Could the animals that the Jews were transformed into reproduce? In other words, are some of the animals we see today descendants of the Jews who were transformed? This is apparently a topic of debate for some Muslim scholars. Court to be said that scholars disagree about the transformation and whether they had offspring. Some people said that apes are descended from them. Most say that they had no offspring. Thankfully, Ibn Kathir tells us that Ibn Abbas said they perished without offspring. If Ibn Abbas said it, then that settles it for me, but apparently not for some Muslims. We can still see questions on Muslim Q&A forums like this. Are the monkeys and pigs that exist nowadays humans who have been transformed? If I made a fake account with a website like that, those are exactly the types of questions I would ask just for fun, but Muslims do it for me. I don't have to. Now, there is seriousness in all of this stupidity. Unless you've been hiding in a very, very deep hole under a very, very big rock for a very, very long time, you know that the Muslim world is absolutely full of anti-Semitism. Now, after reading some from the Quran and from the Tafsir and the Hadith, I have absolutely no idea where this anti-Semitism comes from. If you think that you know, let me know in the comments section. But I am completely clueless as to the source of anti-Semitism in the Muslim world. Anyway, let's look at some modern quotations. In a weekly sermon in April 2002, Al-Azhar Sheikh Muhammad Sayyid, okay, falls right there. Muslims, diversify your names just a little bit. You don't all need to be named Muhammad. I promise it will be okay. Al-Azhar Sheikh Muhammad blah 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 blah, the highest ranking cleric in the Sunni Muslim world, called the Jews the enemies of Allah descendants of apes and pigs. In one of his sermons, Saudi Sheikh Abd al-Rahman, hey, at least it's not Muhammad, imam and preacher at the Al-Haram Mosque, the most important mosque in Mecca, beseeched Allah to annihilate the Jews, the scum of the human race, the offspring of apes and pigs. This idiot also thinks the Quran's garbled mess of stories is history. Read history, he called in another sermon, the Jews of yesterday are the blah 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 who Allah cursed and turned into apes and pigs. But at least Muslims aren't told to hate the Jews until they get older. In the Muslim Woman magazine program, the girl, a three and a half year old, remember that's over halfway to marrying age if you're a Muhammad, was asked whether she liked Jews. She said no because they're apes and pigs who said this, our God. Where did he say this? In the Quran. No parents could wish for Allah to give them a more believing girl than she. May blah 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 blah. Many Muslim children are indoctrinated with this nonsense from a very early age. An Egyptian columnist described Israel's departure from Lebanon in 2000. They fled with only the skin on their bodies, like pigs flee. You can see the, the correlation there because pigs run with their skin on and Jews run with their skin on, and so that makes Jews and pigs similar. It's like Muhammad's logic with the rats and the milk, right? So you have, you have rats that like sheep milk and Jews that like sheep milk and because they both like sheep milk, that means the rats are descended from Jews. It's, it's that logic. So you run with your skin on, you're like a pig. If you're a Jew, if you're a Jew running with your skin on, 
and why say like when they actually are pigs and apes. So we've talked about the past with the Quran and the Hadith and the Tafsir, and we moved into the present and saw some of the effects of this thinking or lack thereof. Now what we're going to do is use the Quran as a springboard to move forward into the eschatological future and look at some future possibilities for the Muslim community. You see, Muslims, you shouldn't laugh too hard at those Jews who were transformed into apes because some of you may suffer a similar fate. Surah 3667 is talking about the final judgment, and if we so pleased, we would have indeed transformed them. Yuri Rubin notes that this is the Arabic word for metamorphosis. The nature of what this transformation will be varied in the early tafsir, but in the relatively later tafsir at a second stage, this metamorphosis is into apes and pigs. And in the future judgment according to the Hadith, the Messenger of Allah said, People among my nation will drink wine. Blah, 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 blah. Allah will cause the earth to swallow them up and will turn them into monkeys and pigs. He also said, From among my followers, there will be some people who blah, 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 blah. Allah will transform the rest of them into monkeys and pigs, and they will remain so until the day of resurrection. And you have a couple of examples from al termity as well. Among this Ummah, those who disbelieve in the divine decree will be swallowed up by the earth, transformed into monkeys and pigs, or pelted with stones. Some sheikh or whatever from Islam Q&A comments, these hadith indicate that such transformations will happen in this Ummah as a punishment for some sins. Muslims, if you find yourselves bewildered by all of this craziness, you do have the choice to sail out of the sea of Islamic stupidity. I highly encourage you to do so. Thanks for watching.